welcome to another episode of the History of the Bay podcast, sponsored by the good people of Amoeba Music San Francisco. Also, make sure you check out Dying Breed of San Francisco on 24th Street, where you get all, all your graffiti supplies. And I got to give a special shout out to So Fresh Clothing for lacing me and D.E. up with some new hats and some new gear. Go check them out. We're going to put their links, all the links, all the sponsors in the description. As well as Stem Social, one of our newest sponsors, too. Behind the lens, as usual, we got King Said. On the boards, we got the one and only DEO. Feels good to be back another round with the team. And we got another special guest, man. We covering all angles of this Bay Area hip-hop history. And this person that we're about to introduce is one half of the legendary duo Mystic Journeyman. He is a founding hey. member of the supergroup Living Legends. He has been paving his own way in the underground hip-hop scene for decades, traveling the world, spreading the unique sound to the masses without selling out for the masses. This guy is the definition of underground Bay Area hip-hop. I'm talking about the one and only Sunspot Jones. Hey, what's up, man? Thanks for having me here on the off show. Top, off yes, top. yes. I'm thank glad you. You're here, bro, because Honest. you got an interesting story. You definitely played an interesting part, and um, I'm sure there's a whole lot for us to talk about. Yeah, man. Let's do it. Let's do it. Okay, like y'all know, I always start at the beginning, man. So tell us, Sunspot, Oakland, California. Were you born and raised there? Born and raised, and well, actually, to be honest, I'm adopted. Um, I never had parents, so I was four. So I was I was born in California. But, I mean, really, I could have been born by by aliens and just dropped. That's how it kind of feels like sometimes. But uh, then, yeah, Oakland, East Oakland, my whole life until uh, I went to college in Hawaii. Well, then I lived in Louisiana. That's another story. But, okay, yeah. okay. So what was your childhood like growing up in East Oakland, man? I mean, it was cool. Like I said, growing up kind of ward of the state because, like, up until I, I was four, like I said, I was living in orphanages or foster homes. And then I got adopted by a couple that really wasn't getting along. So it's kind of crazy. They got together, adopted me. And then, like, they broke up tw two years later. And then me and, you know, it was just me and my mom, and we didn't get along really that well. And I just started running away from home at six. And so from six until about 14, I was in and out of foster homes. And then I got sent, like I said, to Louisiana. And then I had to go to school because my mom was like, that this is the last time you're going to run away and, and put me through the court system and all that. You're about to go live with your cousin in Louisiana. So I got sent to Tallulah, Louisiana, which is hella country. They used to call me city folk. And uh, yeah, basically I was there until like probably for a year and a half. And I, I, when I got there, I turned my grades around. I ain't going to lie. I was like, I'm going back to Cali. I'm like, you know, I'm not going to be stuck here. And um, then I came back and I went to Skyline. And um, the rest is history. Skyline, straight to Hawaii from there to go to college. And um, I wanted to be a marine biologist. And then I wanted to just, you know, kind of be about the science. But then I read uh, Lorraine Hansberry's play. Too Young, Gifted, and Black, and it just changed my life, and I wanted to be a writer, and I wanted to do music, and I wanted to do anything that led through the medium of, of writing. I wanted to do it. And, um, yeah, so music and writing. I came back, I wrote a script for Reg Green, who was uh, Lil' Chris and uh, Boys in the Hood, and uh, he's from Richmond. I don't know if people know. And um, when that kind of didn't work out, I just kind of started doing the music thing, and then the music thing just kind of... It just popped, popped in a way I never even imagined. You know, it was more than the film thing. And um, yeah, the rest is history. This is years later, just doing it and taking it around the world. And, you know, I'm amazed myself. You know, like I said, we, we, we pretty much sold out the Regency as Living Legends in December. And, you know, I started this in 1990. <laughs> I ain't going to say, if you know, you know, you know. <laughs> that is a... That, oh, just, oh, just get the mic. Okay, there we go. That is Thanks. an interesting story, man. Um, from what I hear, just listening to that, I hear a story of self-discovery, mm -hmm. journeys, travels, uh, ups and downs, and that's uh, quite a turnaround to go from in and out of the, the foster care facilities to uh, graduating high school, going to college. Yeah, yeah, that was crazy. It was the only... It was the only way I was going to get independence on my own level where I wasn't going to get scrutinized. Like, being a runaway is nothing good about that. And when, you know, I got accepted to two colleges, San Jose State and Chaminade University. And, you know, 
what are you going to pick? You're going to definitely pick, you know, Hawaii. Mm-hmm. And, um, yeah, and, and I mean, just, just, through that whole thing of the story, what I said earlier is just like, you know, I learned my only way of getting out of the pain and, and the trauma that I was dealing with was my imagination. That's why, you know, writing and music was always number one in my life. It was my way, it was my safe place to go, you know, and that's why I have so many, if you know me, I have so many different creations, so many different things, you know, I've learned through that passage. So, yeah. Well, let's get into the music then. Uh, you are known as a true lover of hip hop. Somebody who yeah. really advocates for hip hop culture. Yeah. Music period, but definitely hip hop. Music period, but I, f- I think like a lot of people know that about you, that you are uh, an advocate for the culture. Yeah. And how did that come about? How did you get introduced to hip hop? I got into all well, like I said, my mom and my dad, they um got a divorce and he was never around really. But the one time I really that always stuck out in my head was um he came over and he was bumping, you know, in his headphones some music and he was hella happy. And I never seen him happy. And I was like, why is this man so happy? I was probably like about seven or eight. I'm like, why is this man happy? You know? And he goes, listen to this. And, and he puts it in my ear and it's Eka Mouse. Mm-hmm. And I don't know. It was like, if this made him so happy, I wanted to be even more to understand. Cause I, I wasn't deep into music then, but like after that, I was like, this is what makes my dad happy. I want to, you know, it's our bond. And, um, mm-hmm. next, you know, he brought me the breaks album, you know, which was old, but it was still new to me. And and like, you know, these were like my introductions to like, oh, these are things that he was into. So, I mean, when you say what got me in, I think it was my dad. Okay. It was like our only bond was music, our only connection, you know, in that moment. And who were some of the rap artists that influenced you from an early point? (sighs) Eric B and Rakim, Too Short, Dangerous Dame, MC Pooh. Um, to it's a list. Conscious Daughters, MC Valentine, uh, or is it Valentine Crew? Um, MC Hammer, you know, um, anything in the Bay that seemed like it was, um, I could, I could really touch. That's what I was really loving. Like Too Short, man. That shit. That my mom, I got some ass whoopings over his albums, just singing, singing along to his songs in the house when I shouldn't. Have, you know what I'm saying? But uh. Yeah, these are the people that really stood out. But then there's also music, in vogue, like different, you know, in vogue. There's freaky executives. There's um, people at the Gilmore. I loved all types of music. It just wasn't hip hop, you know what I'm saying? Because I had had so many different foster brothers and foster sisters where they'd play some music. They'd be, you know, one, I remember one was playing this music. It sounded hella like, what the fuck is this Casio ass sounding ass music? And he goes, this Depeche mode, this shit's dope. And I'm like, Depeche, what? Man, turn this shit off. A week later, I was bumping that shit. Just can't get enough. <laughs> just can't get enough. I was like, ah, oh, that shit's raw. So, you know, I, I find some a little bit of some in every type of music. That's what's up. I I hear it when you say like the fact that you can kind of reach out and touch Bay Area music. Yeah, I think for all of us that's raised out here, that's kind of what makes it special is the fact that it's something happening in our backyard. Yeah. So what what was their process of discovering some of these guys like Pooh Man and, and Too Short? And it's just in high, in high school, it was um, a thing that. You know, these are just the people that were around. Richie Rich, um, Action Pack Gangsters. Um, there, there was just so many different groups. I'm not going to talk about the groups I loved later, like Board Stiff mm-hmm. or like, you know, the other groups that I grew to love within, you know, when I was doing my shit. I'm saying before all that, there was like, you know, this sense of community of these people just doing this music city hall records and all that shit. And it was like local and, and like, you know, there was no internet. So really I didn't hear a lot of different music at that. I mean, it was hard to get other music than the Bay and really, and KML was still half rocks, half hip hop kind of, you know what I mean? Bullshit. Then it went to R and B and then, you know, then they started playing some of the Bay music and yeah, I mean, I was hooked, you know, it, it was, it was my inspiration because I can just go anywhere and sing along. Like I said, too short. I was like, you know, these aren't the tales that are, um, you know, <laughs> cuss words. Uh, you know, there's a gang of them. But yeah, my mom whooped my ass over them albums. <laughs> I think a few, if not most, 
people that come on the podcast when we talk about this, like they have a similar story about yeah. Too Short. Yeah. I, I do too. Freaky, yeah. Hearing Freaky Tell as a little kid and being like, what is this? Yeah, and it lasted forever, it seemed like. Yeah, I'm like, how many hoes is this for now? <laughs> like, yeah, God it's damn, like where did he song. meet them? Yeah. yeah. So. This episode of the History of the Bay podcast is brought to you by STEM Social. If you're looking for ways to improve your health, energy, and overall well-being, check out Stem Social's Five Mushroom Complex. These capsules are a perfect dietary supplement to add to your vitamin regimen. The Five Mushroom Complex has a ton of health benefits and can boost your daily energy and vitality. The supplements contain lion's mane, chaga, cordyceps, reishi, and turkey tail mushrooms. Each of these mushrooms have been used for centuries for their natural benefits. If you want to try Stem Social's Five Mushroom Complex, check out stemsocial.io or go to the links in the description. Now back to the episode. So what was your entry point to, to writing and recording your own music? So basically, I um, was in Hawaii, like I said, and I met this guy named DJ Blast. I used to work the rec, or the rec center. That was part of my whole, um, you know to get money for school and shit. And basically, I um, met him. I was taking care of the wreck, and he was DJing. They brought him in from Maui, and then I just started spitting my terrible-ass raps at the time. I know they were horrible, but, like, they were raw for the moment. And he was like, you know what? You need to come to Maui, and uh, we could just record a demo. I was like, record a demo? I was like, oh, record a demo. Okay, let's get it. So next thing you know, I'm on the airplane flying from Oahu to Maui, to his mama house and you know he had like one of them three to four second uh samplers that's on the um on the equal you know what i mean the mix thing and it was like you, know, you had to hit it again and shit like that and i mean we made probably like 12 songs like just that weekend and um i was just hooked ever since then and i was like you know what F school i was like i'm i was i was like school i'm i'm either gonna start i'm gonna be a playwright or screen playwright or i'm gonna do my music it was like either or on those shits. and um then i came back and i i, I realized well actually this time too dell was one of my friends when i was a kid he grew up around the corner from me we used to like you know trade cartridges and stuff like that as a kid and I, I remember i sent him my music you know a few times from hawaii and like you know he was like yeah that's cool you know that's just cool and that, that was kind of one of the things that made me go um just don't be afraid just make your shit happen you know because I mean? he was someone that sat in front of me in English class English class and and like I remember he came in one day with a Def Jam jacket on I was like what the hell? how did you and he's like I just came back from New York I was doing shit with Cube and all that I was like ah uh. so like I said all these things were touchable in a sense you know being in the bay and these people were taking their magic and putting it around the world and I was like I want to, I'd rather be a part of that magic than, you know, the other thing I was trying to do for my mother more since, you know. So in the early 90s, you, you sensed that there was this uh, this surge of hip-hop coming out of the Bay, or hip-hop period. But not hip-hop, because it was really, it was weird. I was a weirdo, because I wasn't doing that gangster shit on funk music and none of that shit. I was... Putting beats together like with that, where just bits and pieces, maybe off the radio, I sampled some off the jazz channel. Oh, so you was just tweaking. I you. was just yeah, I was uh, making. I wasn't doing what typically we thought was Bay Area music. You know uh, what I'm saying? So it was still a little weird. You know what I mean? And then I had my crew, and we were like kind of native tonguey. We love native tongue. We love tribe. We love daylight. So we were trying to be weird, probably too. You know, and um. You know, so I was making that kind of music, and my homie um, Zach the Lego Maniac, that was his name. Um, he uh, he got his mom to go to this place in Berkeley and actually rent this sampler, and it was this big ass sampler. And I was like, "How the fuck am I gonna learn how to do?" It? He goes, "Just learn. Just we got it for four days." And I started putting together all these beats, and um, I wrote all these songs, you know, kind of by myself. And they weren't really rappers; they were my friends. Because I was uh, when I first came back from Hawaii, I was in a group with someone else that was Mystic Journeyman. That um, Andre the Emperor, the guy that's on the cover of uh, Dell's "Sleeping on My Couch." cover he came up with the name mystic journeyman like he was part of the, just the squad i'd always be with and i was like i'm trying to come up with a name for a group for me and yay post it was young asiatic prophet of soul and um me and yay post were in a group together and i was like you know we need a name and he came up with all these different names a list and then he got to the bottom he was like mystic journeyman i was like that's fucking it 
because I just got back, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> From Hawaii, I went on that journey and I did Maui and then coming back, I was like, Louisiana, I was like, yeah, that's on the move. And, you know, then it just didn't work out with me and Yepo. So I was like, fuck it, this time I'm just going to do it with my close friends that are around me, you know? Not like Yepo was my friend, it's just like the people that I just was hanging out with, I was going to force them to rap. I was going to write the raps. And that was my boy, Zach the Lego Maniac, Anunsi, and Snuffleupagus. And so we were all just basically in this group that was doing these shows that I kind of found this booking agent to do some shit for us. And it was just so young. We weren't really, we weren't really there yet, but we had the heart and spirit and it was really strong. And then it turned into a thing of my boys were like, yo, I got to go to college. Or another one was like, I'm going to just be with my girl. Another one was like, I just want to practice, you know, Islam. And, and I just want to just do my own thing away from this. And I was just alone. I was like, damn, I, I really guess I, I got to give up, you know? And I had this demo <clears throat> that I just made. It was called Throwing Rocks at the Moon. And uh, I was off with this girl I was dating. We were at the Clark Kerr um, um, dormitory in um, Berkeley, UC Berkeley. And I meet this dude with her. Like, she said, oh, you got to go, go meet my girl from LA. Her boyfriend's here. We're all going to go hang out. And I'm like, all right, fuck it, whatever. We go. And I meet lucky Tom like uh, I was like what's good you know won't, won't, on on just friendship freestyling and, and just chilling just like that whole couple of days we were just freestyling and chilling it was so natural and I was like yo um you want to move just move up here from LA and just be in a group with me and of course it was some young ass dumb shit, just thinking someone would do that but he was like yeah <laughs> wait so how long after you met him did that happen that was probably a few weeks. Wow. Yeah. And this is all happening. I just broke up my group and like, you know, it's probably like only a year and a half. I, I dropped out of college and I was living in the back of my aunt's house or actually in the side room of my aunt's house. And <clears throat> he moved up, had a dog, was hiding in my room, sleeping in my room. My aunt and uncle worked early in the morning. And so like they would leave. And then like, so if he was still there, I'm sorry, if they were there, sometimes after we woke up, he would just climb out the window and come to the front door and act like he just showed up. And you know that old one, you know? And um, yeah, we and then we just, yeah, I just needed someone that was serious as I was, you know what I'm saying? And he was serious as I was about trying to just manifest our dreams and make music. And he's such a dope ass MC. Like his voice is amazing. And I was like, we, we are just like nothing else in Oakland. You know what I'm saying? But, um, it took us, it took us some time. I mean, actually, honestly, it really happened back to back to back. Cause like then I, I hooked up with Rano from Disposable Heroes of Hypocrisy, which was a group that was on Island with Mike Franny, who's in Spearhead, a whole another thing that's going on. And like, they were in a group from the Beatniks, the Beatniks broke up. Half of it, I think was Brown Fellini's, the other half was them. And so it turned into like, um, him and Rano doing the disposable and me and Rano just became friends. And all of a sudden Rano became my manager, our manager, me and me and Lucky. And then next thing you know, we're chilling at the Cow Palace with Kurt Cobain at the Bosnian Women uh, Relief, um, Rape Relief um, concert they had. Um, and just crazy stuff in the beginning, you know what I'm saying? Where I can't even imagine it happening, but we were allowed to stay different because we were like, so when you say, how was it us coming to the rap in the beginning? Like there was no underground hip hop when I was coming up. It was just yeah. rap. There's a lot to unpack in what you just yeah. said. <laughs> the first thing that is catching my mind is you got to kick it with Kurt Cobain. Yeah, yeah. I took a picture with mine and we're still looking for this shit, but... Um, <clears throat> Basically, there was a show at the Cow Palace, the Bosnian Relief for Women or Bosnian. It's, it was for Bosnia was going through that whole thing where yeah, there was like a the war and shit. Right, right, right. So they had a rape relief program. I mean, concert basically because all this shit had happened. And L7, the Breeders, um, Disposable Heroes of Hypocrisy, and Nirvana all played. You, you should look it up. It's crazy. Um, and I mean, literally me and Luck were just hanging there with Rano as his guest backstage. There's not that many people back there. And yeah, I met Dave Grohl before he was like Foo Fighting and the other dude, uh, the bass, I don't even know his name. And uh, then there was a time we were all in the kitchen. I really didn't get a chance to chop it with Kurt, but there was a picture moment like, I'm going to get everybody. And I was just standing next to him and I was like, oh yeah, that's cool. You know, and it wasn't even, because I'm this, to me... I don't think of 
of um, how the moment is until later. You know what I mean? So right then, I was just like, all right, this is cool. But then later, I was like, holy, wait a minute. And then Courtney Love was there. Their little baby was in there. I was like, this is going to be history right here. This is crazy. But uh, yeah, so they would say, so once we got on a move of doing, like, you know, stuff with them, you know, not with them, but, like, with Rano and, and so making... I, I want to I wanna go back to a couple other things you said yeah. real quick before you continue the story. Yeah. So... When I asked you about, like, getting into, like, your own rap, you said, well, it wasn't rap. It was, I think you said weirdo shit, right? No, I said I was more of a hip, uh, I was more of a weirdo because it's, it's hip-hop. There was no hip-hop back then. There was a little bit of it going on. Like, Hyrule was definitely doing their stuff, but, like, you know, at that point, they were signed, and they were probably doing the first, their first album. Dell was doing his probably second album by them, but, like, really, it wasn't that much underground hip-hop. Well, were you making a conscious effort to be like, I'm going to make my sound like this I'm gonna experiment or or was that just how it was coming out it was more like you know I just didn't I didn't live that life in my head that everybody else was living when it comes to like what it was to do Bay music you know what I'm saying because I felt like the Bay had so much beautiful you know Tower of Power, like, our, we have all types of music. I wanted to just be a part of all types of music. And then fucking with disposable sport, especially, you know, it's weird, different shit. I just felt like that was good because I wanted to be creative. I wanted to be colorful. And not to say that the Bay rap wasn't colorful. It just only allowed me to do so much where I was more of. Okay, so this, this is where I was going at with my line of questioning because I feel like in the Bay, there is a stylistic split mm-hmm. of, I guess what you would call underground hip hop and mob music. Yeah. To, to especially back then. Mm-hmm. And I'm always curious how real that is or what the circumstances are because, like, when I hang out with like Selsky, like, we listen to Soldier Mitch shit. Mm-hmm. If you listen to his early beats, it's like break beats. Mm-hmm. If you listen to 415, Richie Rich and DJ Daryl, they're flipping yeah, yeah. samples. But um, the rap isn't. But then if you listen to like a Yuck Mouth. Yeah, who, who does have an underground feel. He's got an yeah. underground, he's yeah. an MC. Yeah. But and still, then, he's after though. But then, then you look at a guy like Charisma, who is oh, super hip hop underground. But yeah. if you look at the pictures of him, he's deep yeah. way out. He's yeah. got yeah. a pager on, he's rocking Fila. Yeah. And, yeah. So, and it also, too, this kind of pisses me off in my dealings when I come across fans, certain fans, because I feel like it mostly is the fans creating the split. Mm-hmm. of like, that's not real hip-hop. Mm-hmm. I'd be like, bro, yes, it is. And I, all the underground hip-hop heads I know bump that shit. Yeah. And then on the other side, when I hit, get around someone who's just too damn gangster for their own good, like, oh, what you listening <laughs> to that for? It's like, what are you talking about? He's busting. Right, right, And that right. beat is hard. And then, you know, right. so to me, I'm, and maybe this is just my unique approach and what I want to do with this podcast and History of the Bay is like, I like all of it. Mm-hmm. It all represents... It all, it all raised me. Exactly. You know exactly. Every day, I, I named all these people, like, without them, I wouldn't be me. That's right. for sure. But the whole thing was, I wasn't them. I wasn't in, in the trenches selling nothing. I wasn't mobbing in the old school. I wasn't doing none of that. I was a square weirdo. There's no lie about it. I think, it. Uh, unfortunately, a lot of the people rapping about that stuff were square weirdos, too. But yeah, that's yeah. a whole other story. <laughs> so, do you, did you, this is where I was really going. Did you, so is this split real to you? Like, is there, was there really a split where, like, you couldn't necessarily get accepted in certain circles? This, this is where I was going to get to. So, that's a good question. So, um, yeah, we can, like I'm saying, once again, as as it gets later on in life, you can see what it was, more of a split. At the time it was going on, I just thought I was just doing hip-hop. I, okay. thought, I, was, I thought I was rapping, yes. you know what I'm saying? Yeah. And uh, my music just happened to be that. Like I said, I had all these foster brothers and sisters. I was exposed to all these different types of, you know, music. I, of course, I was going to use it because it was a part of me at that point. And a lot of, and there was definitely other underground artists in that time that was going on when I, I wasn't um, exposed to them because, like I said, there was on internet. There wasn't like a really a mix of, of people spreading their tape, you know, in my, I just didn't, I went to Berkeley, you know, maybe I saw some kind of weird rappers. I go to Frisco, you know, like I said, I met Boris Sip. I was like, wow, these, these guys are on the same kind of um, thing that we're on. But it just didn't see it a lot because they didn't, they didn't, they didn't get the hype. 
they didn't get the the sales or they didn't get the exposure, you know, and that I mean on CMC you wasn't seeing no underground kind of shit. You were seeing what the East Coast was kind of bringing. Yeah, you know? and I think that's another factor too is at a certain point it was the industry favoring I guess you could say more negative subject matter, even mm-hmm. discouraging street rappers from making conscious songs. Like, no, make more mm-hmm. of that booty crack hole music. Mm-hmm. Like, don't talk about a message. So I do feel like the industry kind of probably did create that because if that's all you're seeing on CMC or on the radio, that's going to influence you it's more. It's influence. It makes you think that's what you got to do. Right. Yeah. Right. But it was never that for me because, like I said, I... I wanted to be a little bit different, you know what I'm saying? I wanted to be colorful, and I didn't care if I was weird, just making the music that I thought was more soulful. Not, I don't say it's not soulful, that, that's wrong, but more soulful to me in a sense of what my adventure in life was, my story was right, in life, you know? Right, And I feel like if, I, if you do dive deep enough into your catalog, the Living Legends catalog, the Hyro catalog, whoever, you'll still find some of that yeah. some heavy bass, some yeah, party yeah, music, always. Some certain subject matters yeah. that might... Uh, spill over into other types of genres, but... Um, it yeah, just ain't that. Right. Yeah. It's, yeah, it kind of stands on its own. Yeah. And that's, again, that's why I'm glad you're here and we can have this discussion because I want to tie... That's what I'm trying to do with this platform is tie it all. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Well, that's when I was watching the show. I was like, wait, hold on. There's a couple, you know, there's a couple of uh, people you're forgetting on that. Not like you was doing something wrong, but I'm saying we need to do something too. You mm-hmm. know, we need to get up in there. So I'm, I'm happy to be here. And, you know... This is what I'm saying is that we don't have that exposure. We all need to be, because it's all black music to me. That's what I'm saying. And people don't even look at it as that. And underground, our underground hip hop movement in the beginning, it was nothing but black people at the shows. Right. Like we used to do shows at the black rep. It would be none but black. We had grouch with us and and they'd be like, what the fuck, bro? Get out of here. It was a different atmosphere. You know what Mm -hmm. I'm saying? And, um, it's just interesting. So, so like, I never looked at it as the division. I just knew that I just had to be focused on what I wanted to do or it would get swept up into what I thought I was supposed to do right. and be. Right. That's an important distinction. Yeah. Okay, so going back to the timeline of your story, you're you're in a group with Lucky Knight, Mystic Journeyman, and you, you're running around with your boy Rano. Mm-hmm. And, um, so he's basically mentoring. He's on tour with Sonic Youth, uh, in Vogue, U2. He's on some weird, like, mix, mashup tours, and it's amazing because I'm like, this is how music should be. And, you know, like I'm saying, once again, I'm being exposed to these moments of, like, the possibilities of just, like, just keep doing what you're doing because in, in no way at all were they a normal group, you know, disposed. It was, like, really television, you know, what and people, like, you know, black people especially, was like, nigga, what you doing, you know? But I thought it was a time to speak up from your soul. And I thought it was amazing. And uh, we were just around them and we were around, you know, other people in in a situation where we do a show now in Oakland because we started getting bookings. We started putting our our word out because we were doing unsigned hype. Um, Shouts to Jamal. That was one of the things. And um, Jay Love, that was a higher ground, like just different little uh, venues. Like we were hella young too, and we'd come up and it would be all gangster. Everybody before me, gangsters, as fuck. Even the girls, triple truck, the dick's going to shoot you. You know, I'd be like, damn. And then, all right, and Mystic Journey, <laughs> just the name alone. You're like, who is these names? You know what I'm saying? And um, I'm going to tell you the truth. I, I was on a couple shows with other people where the openers got either jumped or almost got jumped because the people just did not like it. So when we came on, we had to, we had to be like, even though we wasn't like gangster or uh, uh, all that shit, we had to be strong on it. And you had to be kind of thugged out in the sense of like, be real about what you're saying. And that's what led us through. Every time we got respect because we'd be in front of people that had no care about any of the shit we're talking about before we come on. And by the end, they'd be like, we fucked with you. Before, I remember us doing the show at Fremont, me and him. And like, we was like, yo, ain't nobody going to feel this shit because it's going to be straight hood. That's all they want. We started, fools was like, by the time that bass kicked in, it was over. Mm-hmm. And I always knew that the bass, that was our connection. The bass come in, we, we there. So... Yeah, that, and so after that, I was like, we can go anywhere. From there, <clears throat> we were with Rano. Rano broke up in his group. 
we we had a deal that was gonna with, with Polygram for publishing. That shit fell through after he broke up with this group, and we were supposed to be on London Records. That was never gonna happen. So we were back to like we we had our equipment that we got through our deal, but we didn't have nowhere to you know to record. We was at High Street at first, so you know I was like, Fuck it, man, we just gonna do this at the crib. And we're going to let these people know exactly what our sound is. It's, it's underground. It's fuck the industry. Fuck all these fake radio people. Fuck all these motherfuckers that make you pay to play. Not, not like we are doing that, but people that were around us was dealing with this shit. Or we'd have to, you know, we'd encounter people that say, how bad do you want to be on this show? And I'm like, fuck you. And at that point, I st- I'm going to throw my own show. And then we start throwing our own shows. And then we took over like La Pena, the culture, uh, the community center in, in Berkeley. Um, and, and next, you know, we have these packed shows. We, we take over Flankers off of Hagenberger. Next thing, we have all these like-minded people that fuck with the kind of music. And next, you know, we do. We build a community. So the radio didn't even matter no more. It was all the people. We only rocked for the people that came to the unsigned and hella broke shows. And the UHB shows would be packed. It got to the point where we, we moved it to Maritime. Remember, it was like thousands of people. We're like, how the fuck did this happen? And from there, we're like, you know, we're going to take it to L.A. We, we, we hit that glass ceiling here in the Bay. Let's take it, to, you know. But we had, but before that, you know, we had already gone to um, Japan. We already had already gone to Europe. We'd already gone to Australia, already gone to Canada. We had already gone to these places that made no sense. I mean, when we first went to Europe, the first time we went to Norway, that was crazy as fuck. Let's let's run it back a little bit. <laughs> you're, are you going in right now? Sunspot yeah. Jones is going in, ladies and gentlemen. It's, getting, a, lot, it's a lot of information, nah, sorry. It's a long this career. Is, this is some good game. I mean, for anybody that wants, even if you want to do hardcore gangster rap, listen yeah. to what this man is yeah. saying. This is this is a path to do it in your own original way. Yeah. Um, the whole f- the industry type of mentality when you talk about certain deals not fought, coming through and what we said earlier about how the music industry was pushing certain shit, is that kind of where that mentality came All from? All of that, because honestly, the whole thing was being so we were so weird, it, it turned into like, no one really wanted to fuck with you until they saw you be you. You know what I'm saying? And, and the whole thing is the industry will make you think that you got to be a clone, a replica of everything else just to get accepted. And that that waters down your music, that waters down your artistry, and, and it makes you not last long. It makes you a piece of shit, really. And, like, you know, our whole shit was like, we don't care who thinks we weird. We don't care who doesn't want to fuck with us, but you're going to fuck with us if you come to our show. If you listen to our shit, you're going to see that shit got bumped. If you come and see, just be around us, you're going to see that there's, there's strong. We're strong on it. And we ain't scared. And, like, once we started doing that, everything changed. Went to the magazine, unsigned Hello Broke magazine, because we couldn't get no magazine articles. I was like, fuck it, we're just going to make our own magazine. I did an underground newspaper at high school. You know what I mean? I know how to do this shit. And I'm going to put all my homies that's in this like-minded community in this magazine. We're going to write our own articles, and we're going to pass it down. We're going to have our own circulation with people that only fuck with, with real music. At, at that point, we thought that was going to be, like, straight from the heart, not this fucking, yeah, negative, and, and everybody's, like, you know, just hating on even... It's just like we need to. Music is beautiful. I, when did we forget that? You know, I mean, wow. yeah. and and it just kind of turned into even if it hurts, you know, it's it's still it's beautiful. And, and you know, we just wanted to get our message out in any way we could. So we'd be then I'd be on the streets every week or every day on on Telegraph or downtown Oakland or, or East Miami anywhere I could sell tapes. So that's another thing I was going to bring up is, on the Bart. Um, this is where I do feel like y'all really do intersect with the Bay Area legacy is out the trunk, yeah. slanging tapes on yeah. the block. I learned that from Too Short. Exactly. That's yeah. why I was going with that. Yeah. And that's why, to me, Too Short is the dopest Bay Area rapper of all time. Of He's all time. One because he started that whole Yes, line. yes. Um, so Revenge Records. Yeah, Revenge Entertainment. It's revenge Entertainment. It's so. Revenge on all these punk-ass industry motherfuckers <laughs> that's trying to hold us down. No matter what, we're going to make it. And you know what? Revenge, motherfucker, fuck all y'all. And we, we did it. We lived up to it. That's and that's what, what was, it was about. Yeah, that's what I was, what I was getting at. I was, thought that's where the name came from. Yeah. So not only you're throwing your own shows, you're making your own magazines, you got your own record label, and uh, you've, you're learning the business of getting going into selling tapes on the street, also going into stores like Rasputin's, mm-hmm. Leopold's, I'm Amoeba. Amoeba, shout out to Amoeba Records. Amoeba. On Leopold's and Amoeba started our career as well just by buying our shit and just making it, you know, so everyone in the college can get it. That's on Telegraph. So the other shouts thing, to them. too, about tapes is back then, <clears throat> from what I understand for y'all music, it's traveling because people are making dubs. Yeah, yeah, they're seeds. 
and especially you're at a college town, all these kids live different places. So they just planted those seeds for us wherever they went. That's what I'm saying. We'd be in Europe, we'd be in Japan, we'd be in places. They'd be like, oh, we got your tape a long time ago. Mm-hmm. It'd be amazing, you know? So Telegraph Avenue in Berkeley. So you mentioned, um, so now Mystic Journeyman is putting out albums, doing shows. When do you start building with the rest of Living Legends? So, okay, so first time we went <clears throat> to Europe, it was just me and Tom. Second time we were going to Europe, we got kicked out of, um, I'm sorry, the first time we got kicked out of um, our warehouse, we lived on 41, uh, 4001 in, on San Leandro Boulevard right by Fruville in a warehouse. I um, got in a fight with our landlord just Sometimes I'm just like that, you know, but uh, I, I got in a fight with him and basically we got kicked out and we had a chance to like get another place somewhere else. Let's use our rent money for that. And then, you know, I'm like, fuck that. Let's not use our rent money to go anywhere and struggle again. Let's just buy, you know, two airplane tickets and two Eurorail t- tickets and go through Europe and see what we can make happen. One way plane tickets. No, they're two. They're okay. round trips. Oh, we, got round trip. at, okay. we got them at STA tra- uh, Travel Agency, which oh, is a place that's right off of... Travel. Yeah, 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 right off of um, Telegraph. So we bought those tickets and um, we actually got denied entry into England the first time we went <clears throat> real quick. Um, we got there and, and we were at customs. They're like, how are you going to pay to to be here in England? And I'm like, we got these blank tapes right here. We're going to dub tapes. And they're like, nah, no, <laughs> no. You're going to have to go. And then I was like, what? And then they're like, yeah, you're going you're gonna to have to see that. And there's a, the, all the ticketing for the, the airlines was across. That's, they have their own little small one that's in the custom. They go, you're going to have to go book your ticket and go back to America right now. And I was like, fuck that shit. This is when the Oakland came out of me. I was like, who is your boss? I need to talk to him right now. And for some reason, this fool's like, hold up. And, and so next thing you know, we're getting taken into the back room. So all these glass little cubicles, you see people like pleading their little case to somebody. And I'm like, this is going to be bad. This is all bad. We go inside, we sit down. He goes, what are you trying to do? Whoa, whoa. And I, I, I was like, well, we're going to meet because I didn't mention this. We had talked to this guy from the United B-Boys of Europe. I met him through um, XL, who's the DJ for Black Alicious. And... He is like, because I was going around to anyone before. They're like, you know, anybody out there, you know, anyone, like, hook me up. I want to talk to him. And because um, we want to hook up some shows. So basically, I had his number and he had come to the airport to pick us up and he had promised us to take us to Norway and the other sh- and he, he lived in Derby, which was right next to Nottingham and had all the bad ones, the bad, bad females. It's all the black ones. Oof. And um, I was like, he's going to pick us up. He's outside. Well, well, there's a phone number. Well, and I, I, I never chopped. I thought I was at the principal's office. And they were like, you know what? Just don't be doing those shows and you'll be okay. And I was like, okay. A couple of days later, we were doing the show. <laughs> but what were we supposed to do? You know what I'm saying? And um, so that's what I'm saying. Putting it all on the line. Just, just That's why I was like, fuck the industry. Like, we don't need any of these motherfuckers to, to lead us to anything. We just know. We just got to know what we want. That's it. Focus on that. Focus on your belief that you just know what you want. And that's the only thing that led us. So from there, one my Twitch you asked, when did everybody get in? So we went to Europe that time. It was a success. We went to all these places, France, uh, Switzerland, Norway, Germany. And so we come back. We have no place to stay. We're, we're somewhere for a little while. But then we had this magazine on Sign of Hella Broke. We were going to throw a, um, a release for the second issue at this place called Your Mama's Kitchen, which was off of college in, in um, East Oakland or um, off of Broadway. So that's kind of North Oakland almost. But um so we do the we do the show. Actually, Safira comes to dope, and he spits a rap too. And um, he, at the end, I, I meet this dude, this little white guy. I'm like, what? Oh, taller than me. I'm like, he's like, hey, yo, when you guys come back, and he was friends with my girl that I was with at the time. His girl was friends. It's kind of how women kept hooking up people in my band. It's, it's crazy. But he was like, yo, when you come back, you can stay at my grandma's house, and she just passed away, and I'm about to move in there. And this is the Grouch. But his name's Corey. Corey Scoffrin. I'm Corey Johnson. Um, so we moved in with him. Next thing you know, we take him to Europe with us. Not too long after that, I meet Arata, who's from Osaka, uh, Japan, when I'm selling my magazine on university. And he becomes squad crew. And next thing you know, we're taking him to Japan. Merce was in Cabrillo College in Santa Cruz. We had just lived in Santa Cruz not too long before with our ex-manager. But um, we happened to... 
link up with Merce and we find out Merce is, um, lives down the street of Tom never knew down the street from him and in mid city. So next, you know, I'm talking to Merce's mom and Merce is like, you know, now kind of my, my, um, little bro for, for life at that point. Like, cause I promised his mom, I, I got his back. And so now he moves in with us and next, you know, he's going to Europe with us. And then Picasso, um, and then Aesop, and the next thing, Aesop never went to Europe with us. But next thing you know, it just all started coming together. You know what I mean? It was it was weird because it was organic. None was forced. But at the same time, we just met through other people. Eli was friends with a kid that I knew in high school I was in gymnastics with. Like, basically, when I ran away from home, I would sleep at his house. You know what I'm saying? And and years later, his cousin was Eli that now was in my group. It's crazy. But... um. It just all happened kind of like by chance, a lot of the shit. And, you know, that's his history. So you got, this is a bunch of guys who are you're putting out group albums, duos, trios, solo albums. All you guys are kind of doing your own thing on nah, your own. Nah, no. nah, not yet. Because it's oh, like, okay. we're just like, everybody kind of wanted to rap. You know what I'm saying? Uh, first time Grouch was, like first time, our second time we went to Europe before Grouch came with us, um, Actually, because I think he came the third time, um, I, we, me and Tom were staying with his ex-girlfriend and her friend in Richmond Creek next to Kaiser. And, you know, Grouch came to get my four track, which turned out to be a three track because I was using it so much. But uh, he, uh, I was like, if your album's not done when I come back, I'm going to fuck you up. And I was like, serious, you know what I'm saying? So people kind of had to get coaxed into getting their shit together a little bit. But once they did, they, t I mean, Merce always knew he wanted it. Merce was so headstrong. He knew what he wanted to do from the get, but you know, everybody kind of had their thing, but it didn't really happen until 2001 where we all did a group together. I did a, a, a I was at Almost Famous. We all did the album together. Like, I did UHBs before that, Unsigned Hella Broke, which were, like, compilation albums. They were Living Legends compilation just because I, we all lived in a warehouse. I lived in, a, in this birdhouse. Everybody come up to my birdhouse, and we record songs up in there, and I just turned it into compilations. But it was never, you know, Angels with Dirty Faces. That's another one. Um, it was never a Living Legends album until we did Almost Famous where everybody could put something in. And that so was 2000s. Y'all are kind of <clears throat> just developing... Together, yeah, before yeah. it became an official Scared group. was still in San Jose State. He hadn't graduated yet or been been part of the group yet. And, um, yeah, it was just kind of everybody was honing their skills, but it was Mystic Journeyman that was really, really doing their shit, which you already know. And <clears throat> then it turned into Mystic Journeyman, um, Black Sands of Eternia. Black Sands of Eternia kind of introduced Grouch kind of more in our group. And then, next thing you know, it just kind of turned more full-fledged into Living Legends because... We were all together. It was just, it was the way to go. It was all of us together making music together. And um, yeah. But then everybody started doing their own shit because they're like, places like Amoeba was like, yo, we want your music and you can get money right then. We're all like lost boys, Peter Pan. You know what I'm saying? We don't, we don't have no jobs. We don't even know what a job is, but we know how to, you know, go after our dreams. So we're going to make these albums. We're going to make these things and, and put them in an Amoeba. And next thing you know, Amoeba is just carrying all the albums from all of us. And that's how it all started. Or we're on Telegraph and we're selling them all day. Like I'm, I was literally, me and Hubbo Junction, me and IQ, um, we are black, uh, you know, we'd be out there all day. You know, I, I wouldn't have any money to get home because I use it all to get, you know, get there and get a fat slice. And if I didn't sell the tape, I wasn't getting home. So, yeah, it was real. I think that's the type of determination you need to really make it. Yeah. You kind of yeah. got to go all in, like, yeah. plan B. I was like, no job. Yeah. Because when you have a job, that's your safety net. Yeah, your, your, your energy goes to that. And you, I mean, I, I used to work at fucking Urban Outfitters. There's nothing Outfitters. wrong for everybody out there. Hey, no, nah, no, nah, work that shit, yeah. do that shit. But for me, it didn't work. Because, mm -hmm. like, like I said, I worked at this place called Urban Outfitters. So I first started working at The Gap on Lakeshore. It's one of the first things. So I was like, I could do retail. I could do the fake smile and all that shit. And then one day at work, I was like, you know what? Fuck all this shit. Fuck all this fake <laughs> smile shit. How you doing? And I don't give a fuck. I was like, I'm up out this bitch. And I just quit and I just never went back. Yeah. Yeah. At a certain point, you also realize if you're trying to do a creative path, your time is it's important. Is probably more valuable than money in, yeah. in a way. I tell people I had to be broke to make it. 
I had to go down, down deep into the gutter in the sense of like not having anything to build it all up. Because, yeah, if you don't use your time efficiently, you'll be stuck on their thing. You're not going to do it on the weekend. You're not going to do it when you get off work. That's all for TV and laying out or hanging out with hoes or whatever the fuck you want to yeah. fucking be in this every moment and don't care what nobody has to say because it takes that. That's right. Yeah. That's right. Well, I want to also ask about something that I feel is very important in the history records is the Broke Ass Summer Jam. Yeah, Broke Ass Summer Jam is part of the UHB Unsigned and Hella Broke, you know, um, concerts. And that was, so for all the people that didn't have enough money to go to Summer Jam, KML Summer Jam, or didn't have the money to get promoted to be on Summer Jam, or, you know, didn't have the fakeness to be signed to an industry label where they're just going to like manicure you into something fake, we're going to throw our own shit. And that's why I said all the like-minded people, all the people that follow the magazine, all the people that rocked at our shows, we're going to do a finale with all the best from them <clears throat> and just do it, you know, for, start off at Flankers off of Hagenberger by the airport. And, you know, we're just going to, and then we moved to San Jose, the Cactus Club, and they did, you know, Maritime not too long after that. But it was a thing of, this is our celebration. We're proud of who we are and what we do and the music that we make. We don't have to be anything like these motherfuckers around us and that thing. We don't have to be a fake gangster. Don't have to be fun. Most of these fake ass gangster motherfuckers that be rapping, I meet them in real life and these motherfuckers Winnie the Pooh. You know what I'm saying? They soft as fuck. And, and like, I, I'm like, then what am I buying into? You know, what is it that's important to me? So the concert would culminate in this broadcast summer jam thing and, you know, everybody there would have their favorites. And it would be a real kind. It would be to me. It was the real summer jam because summer jam out at the, the shore and whatever that shit was. I didn't care about none of those people's lyrics. You know what <laughs> I mean, none of their lyrics was leading me to a safe place. Right. You know, music. Like I said, imagination was always there for me. Imagination, music that really led me to a place where I believed in myself. That's all I wanted to be a part of, and none of that music did that. It's really interesting, man. Um... Hearing your, this story just makes me think of your fan base, bro. Like, y'all have, I think y'all fans recognize that. And y'all like, this is, you know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. This is the real shit. That's why I fight so hard, you know, in my comments and shit. Like, talk about this. You never talk about that. I do talk. I talk about everything if you really pay attention. And if you look at my background. But... I, it, I'm just saying that y'all fans, like, they love y'all for that. And they, I feel like the people that listen to y'all, like, them. they're like, this is the shit that's for us, that others, they kind of, they feel like how you feel. Mm -hmm. That shit ain't for us. I don't identify with mm -hmm. this. I don't want to go to that show. Mm -hmm. I don't want to be around that shit. This is the shit. I'm going to support it. I'm going to buy the solo album, the group album, the Everything, duo album, yeah. the T-shirt, the yeah, magazine. Support the movement. I'm going to support right. because I know it's yeah. not going to some big corporation. Yeah. It's going directly into the pockets of the people that's making it. Mm -hmm. And it's uh, poof, it's impressive, man. We know we're talking almost three decades later, and we're still talking about this shit. I mean, and, and I tell people always, you know, because sometimes people say something about our fans, or they're this, or they should be this and that. I'm like, yo, you can't pick your fans. These are people right. that really believe in your heart because you're really real about it, like real about what you believe in. I'm telling you, the radio is full of shit that's going to send you to jail, send you to to being broke, send you to, to a place that you can't even believe in yourself because you're believing in this false, fake-ass idol that don't even believe in themselves or probably don't even have a control of their own likeness or, or music. So, you know, it was just always important, you know, even if we got a record deal, KRS-One tried to get Living Legends a record deal. <clears throat> and we went to... He was working for Warner Brothers, and he was an A&R at Warner Brothers. It blew my mind, and he was part of the A&M thing. And uh, I remember going in his office, and I saw all Paris, these— when was an A&R for I Universal? I can't even fucking—I met Cool Mo D at this time, too. He came through the door with a book. I was like, Cool Mo, man. This was so, like— <laughs> I, It didn't make sense. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You know, we're going through a thing. They were trying to sign a group from the Bay. I think it was us, Hobo Junction, and this girl named Treasure, I think. That was a female MC back in the day, and, and someone else. And, yeah, we got invited down. Was it Was it Pleasure? No, Treasure. Treasure, yeah. okay. And oh, you um, know about Treasure Deal? Oh. And um, it just turned into a thing of, like, he was going to sign us because he saw our tape that we have for Broke Ass Summer Jam. And um, I, I, cause I I was doing all the graphics back then, or me and Corey Shaw, but that was when I did. And <clears throat> I had in the L, all the members, 
And one of the members is Aesop, the Black Wolf, and he had his mask on. And he's like, oh, this is crazy. This is like, who are you guys? Like, it was like, there was a shtick or a gimmick, I guess. He was feeling, and let me tell you, how I see Too Short as kind of like a god, you know what I mean? I saw Karis One as a god because he, for one, we had the flat nose together. And uh, he he wasn't afraid to speak his mind. Knowledge of self is like something that was so strong on, on what he spoke on. And I felt it was so important and detrimental to us all to know what he was saying. And um, I was like, how many of these, I was, I was like, how many of these records do you own the masters? He's like, none. I was like, this is the first lesson. You know what I'm saying? Sometimes maybe you shouldn't meet your idols, you know, because you always have a romance of how people should be, right? Um, it never is, but it just didn't work out. And he's really, you know, not a an A&R either. So you don't really see, I don't think there's any artist that you've seen that he put out through, maybe the Temple of Hip Hop he was going to put out at one point, but I don't know. Did you ever get into any of the Temple of Hip Hop shit? No, uh, there's that crazy ass phone call where he's talking to that white dude from Temple of Hip Hop. Like, he's, <laughs> you know what I'm talking about? Yeah. <laughs> we ain't going to get into that. That's but it was so, so, I mean, no disrespect to Karis One. Like I said, respects that man for life. Um, he, he He's the one who gave me my energy too because he'd walk into uh, on a, on stage and just walking and everybody would just start jumping. He's raw. Yeah, he, he's like, he raw. Would, they he would ro- just he start rocks jumping. Shit. Yeah, he rocks. Yeah, like I was like, but South you know, boss. but business. South, yeah, South yeah, yeah. But then it's still gets hype. But still, the enamored, being enamored by East Coast once again. Not you, but like all of us need to find our balance or how we even praise, you know, your heroes and stuff. And I, I just felt like it just wasn't gonna be the best deal. Well, there's a certain point too where. You got to look your idols eye to eye. Yeah. It's, yeah. If you're trying to do this, it takes the confidence. You can't look at someone as being above you. You got to yeah. be able to be like, yeah, what's up? I'll do my shit too. Yeah, yeah. But he he was going to, you know, give us that that chance, you know? And he was like, one of y'all, just one of you guys sign, and then that person be in charge of paying everybody. And we're like, dude, there's eight of us. <laughs> That's never going to work. Because like he was like, I think he was talking about a... Like in the low, low, it just wasn't enough for yeah. motherfuckers to really sit there, and and it was all I felt like off the shtick, a gimmick maybe in his head that like, oh, this wolf, ha ha ha, and all this yeah, stuff. See yeah. how you can market it. Yeah, yeah, and I'm just like, you know, when you get a record deal, a lot of times just that one time, that one, that one is over, one right. and done. You know, mm-hmm. even a lot of times your career is done, especially right. back then. Yeah. You know, so. It was a thing of just like, you know, you just got to build your own thing. You got to build your own fan base. It's important to do that, to build the the people that are like-minded and create a community out of it. I call myself an activist as well because we bring those like-minded people together. Some people don't realize that. Someone told me that that's what activism is, just having conversations and holding space. Mm -hmm. Well, the first Living Legends album you said was 2001? It was like, I can look it up. Dude, we got so many albums. Uh, Can you look that up real quick, Theo? It was 2001? Okay. Thank you. So um, that's how many albums we got. I have probably, I'm up to number 20 on solo albums. Mystic Journeyman probably have about 10. Living Legends has about, you know, that are released, probably about six. But by then, y'all had relocated to L.A.? We had relocated. We did a lot of music here, but then we moved down to L.A. about 2000. Um, What What was the reason for that? It was just because most of the people in my group were from L.A., you know, like I said, Tom just moved up and all of a sudden, you know, he was living in Oakland and, and it was just time for, you know, Eli's from L.A., <clears throat> um, Tom's from L.A., Mercer's from L.A., Scarab's from L.A., Aesop's from Fresno. Um, so it just it just was that time. And, and like I said, we had hit the bass so hard that KML was never going to play our music. And it, it just kind of hurt a little bit just to be like, we had went around the world. We had done these shows where thousands of people are at it locally, and we we can't get uh, one little blurb of anything, you know, from the industry. Once again, that's what's like, fuck these motherfuckers. CMC, no. And then <clears throat> then we got on the box. Do you remember the box back in the day? So I, I directed this video called Mercury Rising, which was a song off the Mystic Journeyman album. It was me, Lucky, and, and Grouch. And that shit got on, and that shit blew the fuck up. All of a sudden, Black Sands of Eternia it was like, everybody had the album. And it was a thing of like, you know, we did something in the Bay and we can't even get love in our home city. It's just time. And L.A. was loving us. Yeah, L.A., we should talk about this because L.A. has a 
thriving <clears throat> underground scene. Mm, the big Since freestyle the fellowship, yeah, side, freestyle man. fellowship, Project Blow, dilated yeah. people, dilated visionaries. Um, it's a lot of them that it, it, they kind of took what what I was doing in a sense and was able to do it in the industry, you know, town and kind of make their moment happen, which was great. But we just didn't have the industry up here to do that. Yeah. So we were searching industry. We were searching a, a way to kind of get our shit out. And, you know, we went down there and we just kind of went even more independent because it was just the only way to get paid. But y'all were doing independent shit on a very <clears throat> professional scale. Yeah, yeah. Like all um, our product looked great. Yeah, is that first Living Legends album the one with the baseball? Oh, that's uniform? classic. Okay. That's the second one. Okay. Yeah. Okay. That's we did a um, nationwide tour and the first tour bus. That's that kind of where I'm getting at. Yeah, second. y'all y'all are building up to that status. Yeah. Of, like you're moving units. Did you yeah. have distribution at that point? We did have um, cut distribution with dot. A lot of different, like we had TRC that was here, but then we also had different ones that were out of LA. And, you know, our show was very cut up in different places. Like I said, we were trying to get money. It wasn't a thing of like one place was going to pay us because they were going to, any major label, especially at that time, was never going to pay you. They're going to give you a upfront, little, real small amount, you know, upfront money, and then you never see money again. So, we kind of built a network, a little chitlin circuit of all these different ra- record stores, and you know, and yeah, we just made able so to make it happen. All still being handled in house. Yeah, definitely, definitely. And, um, yeah, well, the, well, the reason I brought up the <clears throat> baseball theme is like your album covers. You're getting professional photography, mm-hmm. professional graphics. Snap Jackson, Corey Shaw. Yeah, it's all it's holding up to like whatever's coming out from the mainstream. You could put those albums. Oh, you know, I forgot sonically to say, even too. Like I forgot to say quality. this. There was a point. This is funny. There was a point where <clears throat> I was like, "This is I'm, I'm an underground hip hop artist." Yeah, and then someone said, "No, this is your job," and I was like, "Fuck, this is my job." This. At that point, everything should be like, I'm already signed. I'm already out. Mm-hmm. This shit is already professional. Once again, I'm waiting to be accepted. You don't have time to be waited to. No, our shit is dope. Or if not doper, then a lot of this shit on the radio. We don't have to wait for nothing. We don't need nobody to come advise us on bullshit. Our shit's going to come out looking professional. We got with the right people that like that they love to do art too. They're professional photographers, Snap Jackson, professional graphic artists, um, Corey Shaw, who taught me my shit. On, on the graphics and you know we just did what we were supposed to do at that point I felt I love it doing what you're supposed to do hell yeah, yeah no waiting right. yeah we are one of our biggest songs back in the day is Break That Fear you know Break That Fear That Holds You Down and, and that was our, our our motto was like all this shit that we're afraid to do is we're holding ourselves back we don't got time to hold yourself back we do we're our worst critics you know our own worst right. critics so well, yeah, so now you're doing national tours on on buses. With alcoholics. That was our the first people we went. Sorry. It was crazy. <laughs> it was living. Well, actually, we, we um, trailed hieroglyphics on one tour. <clears throat> that was one of our first tours, and that was great. But our first one, we were really officially on the bill and everything. Nationwide Living Legends is with the alcoholics. And, uh, yeah, that was amazing. Yeah, y'all, y'all movement just took off. I almost hate to ask this question, but I want to ask it just so people can see the power of what y'all built. Do you have an estimate of, like, how many units y'all moved? Collectively? Living legends. I can never tell. I can never tell. Estimate is... is, is put it this way, we still here. <laughs> we still here. It's it's never been a problem to move I, those units. I just units. want to say, I feel yeah. like y'all must be in yeah. the millions right now. I mean, and if you look onto Spotify, there's millions and millions. Look at the YouTubes, there's millions and millions. So, you know, I don't want to incriminate past ta- tax, uh, you know, <laughs> shit that I have it on. You know, I don't touch people's guns, and I don't tell people about how the money go, you know, online. But uh, it, it's it's been a thing where... I'm, We've survived. We're still here. <clears throat> We've never. I haven't had a job since I was nineteen. Right. You know, this is decades later. Right. Um, and one thing about your your art, it'll never turn its back on you if you stay true to it. I think that's a, a big a big message that's been consistent in in your music and your brand. 
You guys have also taken hiatuses mm -hmm. here and there. You just recently had the big roots return. That was well, called the return. It's right? called the return. It's called the return. Not like we had hiatuses because we still had big tours. We did 2016, 2017, but we hadn't done an album to. I mean, we've all have had our solo albums that are constantly coming out too. Right, right, right. But um, as Living Legends, our last album, I think, it was 2009, The Gathering. And this is around the time we were on the Rock the Bell store every single year. So, like, we had to make sure we had, you know, product for those tours and shit. But once the Rock the Bell store stopped, I feel like a lot of our thing kind of stopped, too, because we just weren't on that major festival tour anymore. And everybody kind of, as, as Living Legends as a whole, so everybody started kind of doing their own solo thing and, and making their own album happen. And uh, that kind of lasted till... <clears throat> we got to this part right now doing the return and the the response on the return, I'm just, like I said earlier, I thought there'd be some people be like, oh yeah, I remember them, that's cool. But like the response has gotten, I'm just like, God damn, this is, this is an amazing time to be in like right now and, and be an underground artist because in the end, a lot of these motherfuckers wasn't knowing anything about underground hip hop shit until we was doing hip hop, underground hip hop, and getting the, right. the level of exposure we were doing. I was gonna ask, what are your thoughts on the evolution of that? Because that's a term that we've used throughout this episode is underground hip hop, starting from Xerox tape covers and Kinkos, Kinkos mm -hmm. and dub cassettes, slinging them on the corner to I, what I like to call like the blog era, mm -hmm. uh, the internet kind of just changing the whole game. Um, I feel like now underground hip-hop is bigger than ever. Underground hip-hop right now is a, an experienced music form that people have allowed to become almost pop in a sense. Because yeah. everybody, there's a that genre is so strong with a certain, you know, a certain category of people. Like, and it's, then it turned into backpack rap. Yeah, I don't like that term. But, but like, that's what underground. Sometimes is. I gotta use that just so people know what I'm yeah, talking about. Yeah, yeah, but that's the layman's term for someone that doesn't <laughs> understand. Because underground hip hop really doesn't exist anymore in that oh, term. okay. You don't really see people say underground hip hop anymore. You don't no, really see not. that, like, term. So yeah, it's backpack. And then Kanye took that backpack rap moment to pop. Wow. So, it's kind of crazy, and, and it's, it's on, honestly, it's weird for people that still do, you know, non popish underground hip hop sh because it doesn't it doesn't translate until people go, oh, backpack. Yeah, I mean, I, I always use the term underground mainstream. Mm -hmm. It's like, oh, they're underground. It's like, yeah, but everybody fucking mm -hmm. knows who they mm -hmm. are, and they might have some bigger entities behind them. And but uh, there's, I think. I don't know if y'all necessarily get the credit for it. I'm sure if you ask a lot of these people who their influences are, y'all y'all will come up Mystic Journeyman, Living Legends. But when I hear your story and then I think of what's going on now with people like Earl Sweatshirt, mm -hmm. uh, who is some other dude, Fly Anakin, mm -hmm. um, uh, uh, Clear Soul Forces, mm -hmm. um, See, I listen to all this. Don't ever put me in a box. Don't put him in a box. I'm, right? I'm hip hopped right? out, man. Right? I listen to everything. <laughs> um, but yeah, when I when I see some of these dudes that have been quite successful, uh, possibly even uh, more successful, yeah, no yeah. disrespect. No, nah, they have. I um, mean, filling out stadiums and arenas yeah, yeah. and um, you know billions and billions of streams. Yeah. <clears throat> I feel like that's a lane that y'all you we break layers. A Freestyle lot of that fellowship, shit. Yeah. Black Alicious, yeah. lyrics born, yeah. Um, yeah, laid the foundation. We, we laid that, that breakdown so they can atmosphere. Yeah. So we, so these people could walk and get to their destination a little bit better than we did. Because, like I said, we were the weird ones. We weren't pop. We weren't doing commercial music. People didn't know where to put us. They didn't know where to be. Like, okay, this is where it should be. Right. It just didn't until we said it's supposed to be there. Right. You know, and by then, we're, I'm not gonna say we're at the end of our careers, but by then, the the even the people that buy the music, that listen to the music, that take part, like come to the concert, it's just a different. Everything evolves. When you're talking about evolution. Everything evolves, and you know. We're just happy to still have the people that do like our music still there. But, you know, I, I wouldn't even know where to say underground hip-hop anymore because people just don't see it as that no more. 
Well, it's different, and that's not necessarily a bad thing. Nah, it's, um, it's hip hop. It's hip hop is still here. Yeah, it's still going, it's still yeah. evolving. Crazy, y'all are still packing out them big rooms. Mm-hmm. Um, still got the hardcore fans. Yeah, still. I love each and every one of them, man. They the reason why we're here. You know what I'm saying? Right. I doubted them, but you know, I had no reason to doubt them because they were there. Do you feel, um, I think now also we're seeing a lot of rappers talk about retiring or uh, like, you know, one thing that disappointed me, I got to be honest, was when Andre 3000 is like, I'm 48. Oh, what else do I rap? What do I rap about now? But this is a rich motherfucker. <laughs> He's reached the top of the mountain hella times. Yeah. You know, and there's one thing about rich people. We I always remember they're bored. <laughs> they're bored as they use their money on everything. They're actually looking for something to put their money in to get their life excited again. I get if it's a lack of inspiration, but I don't think it should be based on age. But we were taught that way. That's how we scrutinize. I mean, there's times when you were younger, uh, people would be like, I'm not rapping when I'm 30, a 30-year-old rapper? That's crazy. That's crazy. What are you doing? You know, and now people like Chuck D, he's what, 60 or something, Flavor Flav, 60. I mean, these people, like I said, once again, bricklayers that made us see we were actually being foolish not even believing art goes forever until yeah. you're dead and, and after, you know? So, I, I mean, I feel weird when I, when I heard Andre say that, but at the same time, I get where he's coming from. That's why he had to pick something else up to give him new inspiration, give him new wind, and, you know, yeah. and no pun intended. But he, he understood that he needed to find something else that was going to bring light into his life. And I, I, you know what? I got to applaud him because that's what art is. I have a saying that says you should fall in love with something new every day. I something like new. Because, like... like there's nothing that's that's consistent the same that's going to keep you happy. You got to keep growing, keep evolving. That's what it is. Well, it sounds like you're going to keep doing that. Um, you know, I said it, I think I've said it before on this podcast. I feel like eventually, bro, there's going to be a motherfucker that blows at 50. And like, <laughs> just comes out like 55 and just like, oh! <laughs> like you don't, wait, you don't think these trap rappers is, is 50? They're like, like, you don't think fucking baby ain't 50? I mean, come I'm on. I'm saying dog, like man. a brand new, like never, you never heard of him before. And then all of a sudden yeah. he's like, I'm putting out my first CD. <laughs> well, that nigga 50 don't sound like that. <laughs> oh, oh, no, bad, no, bad. <laughs> 70 then, fucking yeah, yeah. 70 year old rapper. I, I mean, know. there is some on it. Instagram. I seen some of this. One. Hey. Art goes on, like I said, until you're dead and and after. And like anybody that gives up on themselves, you know, it's really not probably because of their music. A lot of times it's because they got a baby or they got a wife yeah. or they got a job. Yeah. Or they got they got to be practical. Yeah. There's no practicality in trying to be an artist. Yeah. It's either you go for it or not. And that's what we were talking about early. So, you know, it, it's going to be more artists that's going to keep doing their art. And that's what I'm happy about. I'm, I'm, why would I be stopping, you know? This shit has is, is been... On the backbone of my own understanding, which means, you know, stay on your business, stay on your art, stay believing in yourself. And, and like, you know, just just know what you want. That's the biggest fucking problem. Just know what you want. Once you know what you want, do it. It's simple as that. I love it. I love it. I'm going to go back through the Living Legends Mystic Journeyman catalog after this and right. go back to that time. You know, the first time I heard of Mystic Journeyman was at my boy Kurt's house in, in Hunter's Point. He's like one of them. Hunter's Point White hey. Boys. And he was like, dude, my brother listens to this group called <laughs> Mystic Journeyman. I was like, Mystic Journeyman? <laughs> and then he played it, and I was like, oh, it's kind of tight. And he's like, yeah, they're part of this group, Living Legends. And, you know, y'all had songs about getting drunk and jerking off and all types oh, of different shit. Oh, there was that song, yeah. <laughs> I mean, that's what I'm saying. Why art is art, you know what I'm saying? No, it was, I recognized what it was, even being that young. Like, oh, these dudes is... Like they're being themselves and they talking about something different, but the beats is tight. Yeah, the beats really is slapping. And there's hell of them. They got different styles. I'm yeah, like, oh, I can fuck with this. And, and that's what I'm saying. In the end, if it's not about fun in your art, then you know there's no point in doing it. And like, you can't pick your fans. I'm happy for anybody that loves our music. We started off, you know, I noticed we started off as the ticket buying public as one. But, like, you know, even the people that come to your concerts aren't all the people that listen to your music. You know what I'm saying? Absolutely. And, and, you know, I don't go to a lot of people concerts that I love, absolutely absolutely love. It's just what it is. So, you know, like I said, I'm happy to see them there, and I'm happy to keep creating art. And, you know, hopefully they're going to pick up my new album, Sons by Jones, Bad to the Bones. And it got a lot of dope-ass people on it, you know? Come on. Come on. Go check it out. And the return. And I want to make sure you talk about your book. So... Like I said, so I, I do I do music, but also I, I got um, 
I got other things I do. Like I told you, I started off writing. Um, this is my children's book. My first one is called The Dentist and the Fire Breathing Dragon. And it's about a dragon that has a sore tooth and a dentist that goes through crazy ups and downs to pull that tooth for him without getting burned up. And uh, like I said, imagination always was my best friend and the only thing that had my back. And this is something that, you know, goes on from music to writing. I do a thing at Children's Fairyland. <clears throat> it's called um, Hip Hop Fairyland and the Healthy Dragon. It's ran by my nonprofit, which is called Hip Hop Scholastics. Shouts out to Dr. T Atoko Garcia. Yeah. And, um, you know, this is how I'm moving to the next thing. I want to try to do children's programming and, um, you know, animation and, you know, teach the next generation through my ups and downs of what life is. So this right here is if you see it, if, if a dragon is scared to get his tooth pulled, you're going to be OK. You know, <laughs> that's for the little kids. You're going to be OK. I like that. This is dope. All right. Thank you. So and I drew it all and I wrote oh, it all. Wow. Yeah. Okay, I was going to yeah. ask you to do the illustrations. Wow. Yeah. Sunspot Jones sounds like a children's book author. Too. It does, kind of. I was thinking about that. <laughs> How did you get the name Sunspot Jones? Well, I'm a bright ass dark motherfucker. Mm. That's it. You know, I uh, I had a beef app brother from another planet, which is Mystic Journeyman. Was it, did that come from the movie? Yeah, that can watch my homie Tone, who's actually Sway's um, cousin, was my best friend when I was um, in college, junior college, after I left Hawaii. Um, I went to Alameda College, and I was always riding with this boy every day um, from and to school. But he'd be like, man, you look like beef fat. You look like brother from another planet. And I, I took it as a clown, but then I was like, hey, I kind of like that. That's what's up. I don't got three toes, but, you know, it's good. It's good. And, um, yeah, and then so... I, I used that name for Mystic Journeyman, and then I was, like, making all the beats, too. And I was like, well, I want it to be just a different— I'm always trying to be more and more colorful, so I was like, I want to come up with a different name just for that. And my producer name was Sunspot Jones, because I was a bright-ass, dark motherfucker. I was masterminding. I was the mad scientist. Mm. That was, like, one of my first songs I did, the mad scientist. And, uh, you know, I, I just kind of stuck with that name. It just never went away. Sunspot Jones, Bad oh. to the Bones, coming soon. <laughs> well, there he is, rapper, author, writer, artist. Animator. Animator. Cook. Activist. <laughs> this has been a hell of a story, brother, and uh, I appreciate you <clears throat> Thank coming appreciate on here. You. Like, like I've been saying, this platform is about tying it all together, man. Oakland, Frisco, Berkeley, yeah. Richmond, San Jose, the whole Bay. We got a platform for the Bay, by the Bay, with mm -hmm. the Bay, that everybody mm -hmm. can enjoy. And I hope that by the time this work is done, people look back on the archives and really get this visual audio encyclopedia yeah. of what Bay Area hip hop and, is. And I want to say, just so I, I'm clear about this, you know, the best thing, you know the best thing you can give to an artist, right? What's that? Support. There you go. And, you know, I would not be anywhere I'm at without the support of certain people and other fellow artists that have my back, that saw me as weird but still accepted me in their life. Like the Conscious Daughters, Carla and Carol, they were such an instrumental part in the beginning part of my whole career, too, because, like, they had this commercial success, and I had met them in the beginning of all that, and they would invite me over, you know, to Carla's for, um, you know, her barbecues, and, and Inspector Deck would be there, or or Sugar T would be there, or E-40 would be there, or it'd be all these people that is not in the lane of music that I do, but I, I'm like, you guys are like the people, regardless if I rap like them or not, there's people I look up to because, like, you know, before I had anything, that they're all I knew. You know what I'm saying? And um, so you got to just throw support to artists. If your artist is doing something and you have something up, you know, on another artist, you know, that's what the bay is. Give love, show love, and, and mentor if you got to, or just don't scrutinize people because they're a certain way. But, you know... The best thing you can give to an artist is support. And I just want to give a shout out to anyone that's ever given me support or gives another artist support. Without them, I am nothing. Without underground artists that has like minds like us, like Boris Stiff and, and others, I we would not even exist. Because all these people made us one thing, feel safe to be, feel safe to exist. Real talk. Well, I ain't a hater. I ain't afraid to give props where it's due and right. recognize the contributions Respect. that everybody has played in this game. Uh, shout out to CMG from Conscious Daughters who's yes, appeared on it. this platform twice. Uh, and uh, what you just said it makes me realize there, there's a little more overlap than people realize. Yeah, like yeah. I think if you really love rap, you don't give a fuck 
what kind of style you're in. Nah, if nah. you're dope, you're dope. Yeah. Like I said, Too Short taught me about that bass. That's and right. And Banks, man, come on. So there you go. All of our Mystic Journey machines had that boom, boom, boom. And that's because I was raised on that short. That's right. Yeah. That's right. Well, ladies and gentlemen, Sunspot Jones, you heard it here, History of the Bay podcast, another amazing episode. We're going to have to run this back down the line, yeah, I'm sure. Man, yeah, And if you ever do need our support, this platform is here. Man, thank you. We're going to definitely use it. And I hope you guys go out and support some artists today and listen to some dope stuff that, that brightens up your day, brightens up your soul, and nourishes everything around you. There you go. When he asked me what, I, what an artist needs most, I thought you were going to say attention. Yeah. <laughs> it could be that, but no, it's not really that. It's support, you know? I like that. Be, be there be there for, for artists because we all thrive on each other. I like that. It's much better. We're going to end it on that note, y'all. History of the Bay podcast. I'm Dregs One with Sunspot Sun Jones. Chipper. Shout out to the whole team, y'all. Legends. Living legends. Mr. Journeyman in the house, Me and y'all. Jay. Peace. Word, man. Recognize where you got the game. We got our own style, got our own slang. Northern California is a West Coast thing. This is the history of the Bay. Recognize where you got the game. We got our own style, got our own slang. Northern California is a West Coast thing. This is the history of the Bay.